We are so fortunate to live in America and to be able to to uh, educate ourselves and 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 have the freedom to start businesses. So I am so pleased to have uh, you uh, folks on board with us tonight in class. Uh, we're all, of course, are online. You're at your home, and I'm at my home as well, in uh, my home office that I call it a studio now. And looking forward to getting started with our uh, class number six of uh, of seven. And this is my presentation, number 1029. So thank you for joining me on my journey of uh, entrepreneurship. And let me be a part of your journey as well. We've got some new folks with us tonight, so I'll take a little bit longer with our introduction. Uh, I am not a lawyer or an accountant tax attorney or anything like that. I'm just a fellow that's been in business for 63 years, uh, still in business, still very active uh, with my internet business and other situations serving customers all over the United States. And also for the last uh, uh, 15 years, been involved in uh, doing entrepreneurial training. So the first piece of advice I, I will give you, free advice, is always get two or three opinions before you make a major decision that's going to affect your security or your business. We are so fortunate tonight to be sponsored by the community college that most of y'all are closest to. That's James Front Community College at Kenansville. It's an absolutely wonderful school. And a part of that college is the Small Business Center, which John Hardison is the director. Now, John's phone number and email address is here, and he would really love to have a phone call for, from you. Uh, set up a, maybe a one-hour appointment, uh, or he can come out to your place, or you can go to his office, and he'll just be amazingly helpful to you to help you uh, answer questions related to your business. His office is over in Warsaw uh, on uh, Penny Branch Road. It's very easy to find. He's got a fine office, very comfortable, where you can have a, a private conference there. So let me encourage you to have a meeting with John and help you go. My job uh, in this series, in this business, is to be a kind of assertive. I'll go ahead and apologize right now if you think I'm stepping on your toes or pushing you too hard. I'm not doing it because I'm uh, angry with you or anything. I'm doing it because I'm just wanting to give you the encouragement that maybe it'll take to get you motivated to get past the uh, procrastination that we all have. So that's where I'm coming from. And what we do is we hear from our, our regular uh, classmates that are, are on board with us, and so many of you have been with us since day one through all the classes so far, and I'm glad to have you, plus the new ones as well. That's the nice thing about this series. You can jump on at any time. Uh, Ed uh, Romero and his son Caesar have got their contracting business up and running. Ed's staying in touch with me weekly, telling me about new things he's doing and some new things he's trying. Tierra Woodard is a long-haul truck driver. Uh, he's been with us uh, for uh, sessions in the last semester and back with us tonight. And he's offering a lot of help to folks any way he can, so I appreciate your willingness to help. And here's Penny. She is our uh, remarkable resident redhead label, and she's online with us tonight, so y'all can send her a, a, chat a chat message and congratulate her. Because she has really got it going on this spring, uh, uh, interested in all that we're talking about and doing in the program. Uh, last week, uh, we discovered that she had her uh, business uh, by by uh, Google uh, account registered, got it up and running, and got some photographs on it. There's a free website basically for you, and if you if you work it and put your photographs in there and your messaging. It'll be a remarkable marketing tool for you. Uh, she's already got some uh, photographs posted at that uh, uh, my business on Google accounts showing her, her wares and showing what people can do. It's also got a map to her house. And lo and behold, we noticed that somebody, yours truly, had, had did a uh, Google review. Uh, so she's got five stars, and that's the beauty of this, uh, my business on Google account. Uh, Penny, let me ask you, uh, have you got any more stars since we talked last week? So she may be away from her microphone now, but when you do have a Google account, you want to always keep an eye out on what the comments that people are making and the stars 
because you can respond there and actually get some more exposure. I'm sure that she does. When you do get your account, you go ahead and you start working your friends to write in and give you real good reviews because it goes a long way to helping people stay with you. Penny asked me some questions. and uh, Well, first of all, she shared with us that she's been working on her DBAs, as I'd asked for. You want to be uh, specific as you list your profit centers and you start marketing them, uh, just not to say jewelry or just not to say furniture or just not to say lamps or canvases, but to put a title on them, put a signature on them that will help people remember them and such as that. Now, with jewelry, you might want to break that down to all the different types of jewelry and, or, and, and such as that, and maybe even have some some uh, group uh, uh, presentations of, of uh, a series of jewelry. So, But this is an excellent start, and I like the way that you have, have given them some good names. You also, when you want to give, when you uh, put names on them, uh, another thing to think about is to put your, your location so that people that are... Uh, uh, in a certain area that's searching for you, the DBAs will come through better if, uh, if they can identify with a region, such as Cape Fear Jewelry or New Hanover Special Jewelry or, or uh, uh, things like that, uh, Cape Fear River Region products. Now, those don't sound too hot to go with jewelry or these products, but if you can figure out a way to, uh, to get a, a regional name in there, that, that is just fine. And you don't have to stop with one. Maybe you have five or six good ideas. Put them all out there. Put web pages on each one of them to help you get moving. What I was most impressed with was is that uh, uh, Penny shared a new video with us, and let's take a look at that. Turn your uh, volume uh, up so you can hear these better. Hey everyone, this is Pitty from Resin Redhead. Wanted to show y'all some jewelry items that are in our focus group for the month of March. Necklaces, bracelets, rings, and earrings. If you're interested, send me a message on www.facebook.com backslash Resin Redhead. Y'all have a blessed day. Bye. That's a fantastic message. So when I asked Penny if she did that herself, she said that, hey, that she had, that she had done that work herself, and I was so uh, so proud of you Penny, for taking that initiative. I'm looking forward just to chit chatting with you on the phone, maybe to see uh, how difficult it was to to take in that new uh, ability to to uh, edit the videos, uh, and uh, did it cost any money? How much time it takes? Because the more skills that you can do yourself editing videos, the faster you'll be able to to get your marketing uh, campaigns out there. She indicated me, to me in a in a response on an email that it wasn't that bad. So, Penny, if you want to turn your mic on and talk to me about that a little bit, I'd like to like to have that conversation whenever you're ready. Let's see. Okay, it's not coming on. Let me see if I need to oh, unmute you. Okay, I think I got it. Okay, good. Uh, how difficult was it to uh, do that editing on your video? It's really great. I noticed the transition and the twirling and just lots of uh, fancy things you can do. Talk to our class about that. It was not difficult at all. Um, I just went into my app store on my Android phone, and it's a app called Splice. And it just, it pretty much walks you through the whole entire thing. I had so much fun doing it. So, <laughs> and it only took me like five minutes. So it really wasn't that long. Well, I don't have to try it too. I'm, of course, I'm 50 years older than you are, and I don't catch on to things quite as fast. But uh, that looks like that's just a wonderful app that you can do some magic with your videos. So thank you for sharing that with everyone. I appreciate it so much. Oh, you're welcome. And Penny also asked, uh, you know, we're approaching the end of our first uh, series of seven weeks. Uh, next week will be uh, presentation number seven, and that will clean up our first series about our core topics, and then we will immediately go into uh, five weeks of another series that, uh, that you can start. Uh, but Penny was asking, what's, what's, what's on board? What can we do after these seven weeks? Well, here's the reality of it. You're, you've got the basics now to keep you very busy. 
So I like to say it's time to start perfecting your game. Uh, last week we talked about how to perfect that uh, that promissory note. Now we're going to take the information that we've shared with you and we encourage you to, to go to your SEO landing pages and, and uh, put that uh, content in there, uh, put lots of uh, duplications on words down at the bottom of your pages. In other words, you want those pages to move up to the top when the search engines come along with certain, certain search terms. So that's one thing to be important to do. Just as Penny has started doing, see how you can uh, take your uh, profit centers and give them some good DBA names uh, so you can market them to different groups. Uh, you might want to consider installing chat on your website. I talked to uh, Vanessa about that last week. She encouraged me and I called my webmaster and said, let's give this a try. Well, he took a shot with a a couple of chat providers and struck out. They were just too difficult to to use and to install. And he's a great webmaster, so he's still looking for the right uh, 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 app to use with chat. But I, I want to put that at my website just so our website will be more personal. So you might want to do that. Vanessa indicated that she uses <clears throat> the platform Wix with her website, and it's got a, a, a chat option on there that is very easy to use. Kind of wish I had that uh, same option on mine. It's time now for you to take serious the opportunity to go to Facebook and start flooding Facebook with small ads about each one of your different profit centers, uh, filling it full of the SEO words because those ads at Facebook stay on there. So you can go uh, create a personal page and then a business page and start just loading it up with lots of small ads. They don't have to be fancy or significant, but you want to uh, uh, have people to be able to find you based on your profit center, and Facebook is a very inexpensive way to start making that happen. Your YouTube channel has got to be on the list of important things to do. I, I want to tell you that uh, these videos are, are the uh, dynamite in marketing these days. Uh, so you, you get your channel, and when you get your YouTube channel, you, you'll find there tutorials and places to edit your YouTube videos very easily. And then you can take in uh, additional apps, apps like Penny was talking about to enhance them anymore. But being active on the uh, and having your own YouTube channel is a major, major thing that I want you to do. It's time now for you to start sending out those emails. Get your uh, get your database working up, get some promotion started, and start sending out emails on a regular basis because remember, you you got to have fresh bait in the water and to catch customers, you need to send them fresh promotions on a timely basis. So feed that database. Today I added six new names to my database. I had incoming email from customers asking questions and asking for quotes. Uh, when I sent that quote back to them, I automatically copied and pasted their email address over into our database. So in merchandising, if you have items that you might want to carry out in the community and find uh, places to uh, uh, retail uh, your sales or to sell your stuff wholesale, uh, if you've got product, let's go find some places out there to sell it if you have that type of product like uh, 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 thrift shops, craft shops, uh, jewelry stores, gift stores, things like that. Uh, consider adding products that people need to your uh, marketing campaign, products that people need. Every one of the five quotes I sent out today were for items that people needed, not necessarily just wanted, but they needed it for their farm. So uh, find those kind of things that people will want. So someone would say, well, Penny, Penny might say, well, I don't have anything that people need. I've got, I've got jewelry, and that's all about you know, fashion and things people want. Well, let me share with you, Penny, that fellows like me and husbands and other folks and mamas and grandmamas and other people, they need to buy gifts for their loved ones from time to time, whether they're doing anything else or not. So you may want to take a slant on, on, uh, on your products, thinking in terms of uh, uh, the DBAs would have uh, the word gift in them or jewelry gifts. Uh, to do that because uh, a gift is things people need uh, uh, and, and, and they're going to buy them no matter how good uh, times are. Uh, with your skills, whatever they are, 
uh, and I've noticed that Penny, just if she's talked to us tonight, she's got lots of skills. So you might consider offering yourself uh, as a virtual administrative service. Uh, we notice the same uh, skill levels with uh, with Vanessa, who's doing just a good job, and and uh, so uh, happy that she is considering not only uh, starting to build websites now, but also to uh, consider uh, maybe entertaining doing virtual administrative services for other entrepreneurs. Very needed. All of us, other people who are kind of struggle with computer skills, we need that type of help. But then I want to say the reality check. I want you to pace yourself. If you charge into this so hard that you're burning up midnight oil and, and, and uh, you're, you're wearing out the erasers on your pencils too fast, be careful to pace yourself. Uh, be excited about getting this work done, but pace yourself and take time to charge your batteries and have some time to be happy. That's a very important reason that you're becoming an entrepreneur is that indeed uh, you'll be able to have a good life and enjoy what you're doing. Sometimes we just get overrun with so much to do that our, uh, we put in a lot of hours in the day. I want you to, to plan to, to charge your batteries. That's very, very important. I want you to plan to stay inspired. Uh, don't, don't let yourself get into the, into the ditch or into the rut. Entrepreneurs cannot operate in a ditch or a rut. We have to keep on top of it, keep our eyes open and do that. And it's so easy to let someone push you down to that point. And encouraging others is the very best way that you can encourage yourself. So uh, let, let me encourage uh, you all to think about that. I was noticed just for a flash here that Jennifer was mentioning that she might uh, be interested in virtual administration. So any of you that are, I need you to send me an email. I don't need your name and your hometown and your email address and the types of services that you might be really good at. Uh, it might be uh, social media. It might be email uh, management. It might be things dealing with financials or bookkeeping or things like that. Uh, I have a lot of requests for folks that are looking for people to help them, and I'll be glad to add your name to the list. And maybe if you're in their area or you have the skills they're looking for, can really help you move along with your career. Hey, Tamika, thank you for that great smile and for all that you're doing. Uh, Tamika shared information with us this week. She says, Versatile NC, your premier vending machine service. Premier vending machine service. She is in it big time, and she uh, sent us a list of her new profit centers. She's going to try to put those vending machines. Well, excuse me. She is going to put those vending machines in apartment complexes nursing homes, malls, laundromats, hotels, and lots of other places. That's exactly what I wanted your profit centers to look like uh, because now you start making a, a, a target list of, of places that you will start doing some business uh, right away. So thank you so much for that list. That's a, a great list. And she also went on to talk about different items that she's going to put uh, in vending machines, and it's quite a variety of different type of items, including hair products and car cleaning products and laundry products. So that's a great idea. I like the variety. I'm looking forward to seeing how you move forward marketing that. For each one of these uh, types of machines that you're doing in each place that you're doing it, uh, I, I suggest that you have a, 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 an individual YouTube video that you can post at your YouTube channel and people will do it. When you're naming these videos, you name them uh, the same name as the uh, as the profit center's name. That way, the search engines will find your video faster than any other way. I had a gentleman that called me today from Tampa, Florida, has never seen our website, never heard of us before, but on YouTube he typed in Mini Round Baylor, and ours came up first because we're good at this. And he saw our video and got my phone number off of it and called me. That's pretty amazing. That's a $14,000 package he's thinking about buying. Uh, that's a big ticket sale for me, so I hope that it comes through. But it was generated by that video. That's, that's how quickly they can work for you. Uh, she came forward with an MVP statement. I kind of helped you rewrite it just a little bit to make I hope you don't mind, uh, because you had a lot of it that was just on, and I appreciate the way that she did it. Very simple MVP statements. 
all of you want to have one of these, uh, and I'm sending you um, study guides to help you get it. So here's what I want to say. If you're not getting your uh, study guides by email in, uh, in advance of our our uh, uh, programs, uh, then we've got something wrong with your email address. That's why I ask you every time to, to type in and log in with your name and email address so we can do that. Let's see here. Someone's got me a message over here. Let me see if I can see what it is. Someone says her mic is not working. Oh, that's Penny. So you, oh, Okay, so you typed in it wasn't working, but maybe it came back on. Excellent video, Penny. Thank you so much. Yes, you did have an excellent video. MP, MVP stations, you know what it does for you? It reminds you, it reminds me, I have these statements on every one of the emails that I send out and on our web pages. So every morning I'm looking at what my MP, uh, MPV statement is, and it really pumps you up to do a better job. It is really a tool that helps you keep your standards up high and reminds you how we need to talk and act with customers. So thank you so much, uh, Tamika, for what you're doing here, and I hope you uh, like the little changes we made in there. She's got a lot of work in progress, uh, like we all do. That Google My Business pro profile is waiting for verification. Uh, make sure you send it to me when you get it up and running. So I'll make some good comments and make sure you get some stars. She's working on her or Facebook uh, ads, and uh, you don't have a great opportunity on Facebook to make it because uh, in social media, so many of the places that you want to put your vending machines, those people that own and operate those kind of stores are on Facebook. So when you are ready to do a good, strong marketing campaign there with some good pictures and, and uh, uh, good voice uh, videos, I just know it's going to help you start your business. Uh, you got some great pictures out here. It looks like you're after some good machines that people would be proud to have in their lot. Kenny, thank you for staying with us, uh, offering help to a lot of people. I really appreciate that. So Kenny's probably on the road tonight. He may join us. I see us some phone numbers up here. Sometimes he logs in with a phone number. But thank you for your good hard work. And Vanessa, Vanessa, I mean, this is a spark plug. I've had a chance to uh, work with Vanessa right most of the last two weeks. And I'm uh, just so happy to have this opportunity and to help send business her way. She indeed has got a great My Business on Google account. Uh, she's getting lots of stars. Why is that so important? Because when people see those stars, by golly, it just takes away a lot of the anxiety they have about doing business. And it, it, it is an instant uh, confidence builder for customers that want to do business with you. Vanessa reminded us that uh, these... Uh, uh, QR codes are really coming into play after the uh, uh, Super Bowl of the week. Every ad had uh, QR codes on them, and uh, it's time that we all get these on our, our business cards, and if we've got a type of product that it, it can uh, play a deal for you, it doesn't cost a thing to put them on there. So Vanessa gave us a really good video to work with uh, last week, and, and uh, we have... Uh, did a little fine tuning on it with my virtual assistant Maddie, who lives over in the Burgall area. Just to give you an idea. Y'all got a excellent person over over your way, but Maddie's been working on this, and she put some bells and whistles on this, and a little bit of uh, uh, Vanessa's favorite music. So this is this is perked up just a little bit, and there's nothing to stop Vanessa from adding and uh, away to it because uh, at your YouTube channel you can make edits as you want to go. So Turn your uh, uh, turn your mic up really good, uh, your, your speaker, and listen as we show you how to add a script on the bottom. We show you how to name your profit centers. We show you how to talk about your targeted customer groups. Vanessa has a good entry, a, a short entry that uh, makes her look really good. She does a great job with it. And at the closing, she closes it out, and in the middle, You've got a professional voice that uh, is, uh, that when people hear that second voice, they uh, pay different, different and more attention to it. So turn your uh, turn your mics up, and here we go. Beautiful baby, Vanessa. Beautiful baby. Hey y'all, I'm Vanessa McIntosh. I'm the owner of Five Alarm Logistics. Five Alarm is one of the very few coin manufacturers in the United States. 
and we're located in Yancey County, North Carolina. All these products, including coins, hats, shirts, and more, are great for gifts, awards, promotions of emergency service agencies, dispatch centers, fire departments, law enforcement agencies, emergency medical team departments, search and rescue teams, correctional facilities, and by the way, these coins are great for special occasions with businesses and employees, family events and reunions, athletic teams, all military branches, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Forest Services and private organizations. Don't wait. Call or email the message today to place your orders and let us know when you need delivery. Thank you for choosing Babylon Logistics. What we're doing here is showing you how to take a, a, a raw video that you can do and just spend time with it just like Penny had, did, had done today and and what we're doing with Vanessa, adding uh, new power to just a simple raw video. Uh, Vanessa, uh, first one, uh, add everything in it, but what we tried to do here is uh, maybe someone doesn't like just looking at the at the visual, but they do like that music in the background. That was Vanessa's, uh, one of her favorite tunes about favorite artist that's playing in the background. So people might just stay on board another few seconds just to listen to the music and relax a little bit. And uh, while uh, Maddie's voice is talking, she's got that nice little smooth voice, which kind of uh, encourage you to stay with you a few minutes. She's naming off the different products and then moves in the naming off just lots of different uh, targeted customer groups. So if you're sitting out here somewhere all over the United States, and you're a member of one of those groups sitting there listening to the uh, to the music, and you hear that group name, well, you'll perk right up. So that's what you're that's what we're doing. We're targeting customer groups here with our different profit centers. So I want to play it again. I want you to take in and emphasize this is not an expensive thing to do. As as powerful as it is and effective as it is, there, it takes no really great expertise. It just takes someone that loves these skills of editing and picking their music and having fun creating things. So let's let's listen to it one more time. Turn your speakers up. Hey y'all, I'm Nessa McIntosh. I'm the owner of Five Alarm Logistics. Five Alarm is one of the very few coin manufacturers in the United States. And we're located in Yankee County, North Carolina. All these products, including coins, caps, shirts, and more, are great for gifts, awards, promotions of emergency service agencies, dispatch centers, fire departments, law enforcement agencies, emergency medical team departments, search and rescue teams, correctional facilities, and by the way, these coins are great for special occasions, businesses and employees, family events and reunions, athletic teams, all military branches, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Forest Service with a private organization. Don't wait. Call or email the message today to place your orders and let us know when you need delivery. Thank you for choosing Five Alarm Logistics. Hey, I'm so happy for you, uh, Vanessa. I hope that that uh, opens some doors for you. And for all the rest of you, uh, uh, Penny, that's a, that was a good example of how uh, focusing in on maybe uh, jewelry for teenagers or uh, it's, it's beach time uh, jewelry or, or different things like that to do a different video for each one uh, uh, load them up at your uh, YouTube channel with the right uh, titles and people will find your business through that YouTube channel very very well so thank you all for through the series uh, sharing your work with us we certainly use them as as uh, teaching tools to try to help you Send me some work, and by golly, we'll share it with other people, and it'll help them as well. In your study guides that were sent to you, uh, you've got the regular handout, number 1029. Uh, you've got your quiz and answers uh, 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 for the uh, for the series, uh, 40 drill skills, 21 negotiating tactics we'll talk about tonight, and some other negotiating items. These are very important. Now, your quiz is the uh, is, is the uh, quiz for this series that will uh, be ending actually uh, the first part of the series will end next week so uh, after next week I'll send you out some uh, some blank quizzes I'll move the questions around and ask you to fill them back in and send it back to me 
everyone makes a hundred. Uh, if you've got some questions you want to ask me before you send it in, fine. Or you could just put a question mark there that you just couldn't find the answer. So this is an open book. But more than anything else, I want you to understand how this question may affect your business. And if it doesn't come through loud and clear, then let's talk about that. These are The quiz is not to hurt you in any way. It's to help us learn more and remember more. So we've been doing the 40 drill skills all along. Tonight we're going to wrap them up uh, for the last time, and it would be up to you to study them individually and to use them to earn your uh, extra uh, uh, extra effort awards if you want to do that. So we started out with week one, and we went through just a, a bunch of them, went through down through number six. Uh, for those of you that are new to this, uh, I'll send you these drill skills so that you can read them on your own and also uh, in the uh, email there's a video that you can watch with the first 30 and by the way is always an important word and did y'all pick up did you pick up with uh in, in vanessa's uh, uh uh video that uh maddie was using the term and by the way uh penny I, did you have him by the way in yours i believe you did if not you always want to add that in because it catches people's attention want to keep sending those promotions out and the best way to find customers is to help them find you our business must be everything to some people. Uh, you've got to be careful if you're paying uh, your, your long-term debts off with short-term cash flow. can't do that. Marketing is the big picture. Advertising is the short-term picture. Who's your toughest competitor? It's you and your distractions. How do we fight that? Is we set better priorities. Define fair market value. You need to know this. You need to be able to determine what fair market value is with the item you're looking at because we want to buy below fair market value so we can sell above fair market value. The L and the H is to look in the hook. And look in the hook is a great way to gauge your, your marketing effort and have a call to action, a call to action, a reason to call us up today. Uh, Maddie had that in her voice presentation, and Penny was doing a good job encouraging people to call you this afternoon so that she can help you with what you like. We want that uh, positive cash flow. We don't want negative cash flow. Take it or leave it merchandising it will absolutely run 80% of your people off, so that's the final way not to use take it or leave it. If you're new in pricing your product, the three times rule will help you get started. Uh, you'll get a third of your money up front. Uh, that will help pay for your cost. Another third will help pay your uh, overhead, and the last third can be your uh, profit and tax money. The 27 times rule was saying that we need to plan our marketing campaigns well out in advance because a customer doing the best you can do will miss seeing your ads two out of three times if you've got them placed perfectly for whatever reason. So if we're looking at a long-term advertising campaign, let's think in terms of of getting 27 messages out there. A good tool in negotiating is yes, if, and no, but. would we'll dive into that tonight in just a little while. What is your most important web page in your business? Your mobile page. What is the second most important web page in your business is your landing pages. So you got to spend that attention there. We have to have customers coming back to us and repeat business to have a sustainable business. What brings them back? 40% of the time it's customer service, but 60% of the time is hospitality. Hospitality is how people feel about doing business with you. Now, <clears throat> we didn't talk about this before, so I'm going to spend a little more time on this. Tonight, I'm going to talk about it even more. When closing deals, you really need to, need to do your best to be able to send and read nonverbal communications. Sometimes we learn more in, 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 in uh, negotiating by what people don't say than we do by what they do say. Who motivates other people? It's an assertive person. And an entrepreneur that owns your business must develop some assertive type skills to help, number one, motivate yourself, number two, to help motivate employees, to help motivate people to give you good deals, and to help motivate your customers to close deals. So. If you're shy and just don't feel like it's in you to be a salesperson, uh, get over it and let's develop some skills. Next week, well, I'll show you some things that you can 
uh, uh, stick to your ribs with, okay? Tax avoidance is a good thing. Tax evasion is a bad thing. We'll talk about those next week. Don't matter how many times we get knocked down, my friends. As an entrepreneur, it matters our ability to get back up and to stay in the race. Uh, in entrepreneurship, the way you win the race is to stay in it. So we have to keep getting back up because people are going to tell you, no, I don't want it, nine times more often than they tell you, yes, I do want it. Now, I'll tell you this. if you've been After you've been in business for years and years and years, then you get a whole lot less uh, no's from customers than you do yes. I've, I've learned that because I have learned how to, to, to uh, present my presentations, to do that negotiating. And so the longer you stay with it in business, the better off you're, the better you're going to be at it. Is your legacy going to name you a taker or a giver? A taker or a giver? If you're a member of the Association of uh, Entrepreneurs and Associates of the Academy, then we're going to be givers, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Being the best person you can be and helping others and letting your light shine will go a long way to help your business do well. Last week, or week before last, actually, what was that magic marketing moment? Remember, that was the key. That was the key to the Golden Goose marketing campaign that I want you all to have. So once you make that sale, you had the magic marketing moment after you go back to that customer and follow up. Follow up, reminding them that you're that you're trying to make sure they're 100 percent happy, and then ask them if they have any planned purchases or appointment dates or tips for business in the future. That is where you gather information to add into your calendar to uh, pretty much ensure cash flow and business in the future. Making that work for you is the key for your business to stay in business. Add videos to web pages for all the reasons we've talked about. Leap and acknowledge and welcome a customer. Now, this is taking it to the finest degree that people would not ever tell this to you in a college class. You wouldn't ever get this in any other classroom. But let me tell you that out here in the real world, when you have a chance to meet or greet or work with a customer, your initial action to put a smile on your face and get up out of your chair and walk to them or extend, lean over and extend a handshake to make sure there is no doubt that you are that, they, that you are so happy that they came your way. Not it's just not a look up and say hello or a smile and you maybe you th uh, think you're pretty or beautiful or handsome or something. So you really don't have to reach out to anyone. Well, that's bull. That's bull. If you want to create a winning relationship from day one, from set, from second one, we have to get up out of our chair and shake hands and what would seem to be leaping for the uh, uh, ability to start a new relationship. When you do that, you are acknowledging that you are in it to win it with this customer, and people will appreciate it. Don't be lazy about greeting people. Keep your radar turned on. It's your radar, it's your brain, it's getting in the game, it's being the quarterback. Keep your radar turned on for what's the next hot thing. What's the next hot thing in Wilmington, North Carolina? What's the next hot thing in fashion? What are the what are the young girls thinking about all of them are talking like they want now? So if you're in the fashion business, you want to have the next hot thing. But indeed, the next hot thing, if it's something people need, and it's not just a fad that'll be around a while, that is really important. So you have to keep your brain open and your radar turned on for locating and thinking about that next top thing because that's going to be your next hot profit center. I want to tell you that you can uh, use informed and structured forecasting to avoid a lot of things. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, forecasting helps you avoid uh, those Murphy curve balls that are coming at you, uh, pitfalls, unpleasant surprises, and unexpected expenses. That's why tonight's presentation is going to be so important for you. How can you be the best negotiator that you can possibly be? <clears throat> You'll do it with extreme 
not just light, not just uh, a little bit, but to win the deal, it's going to take extreme prep preparation, and you'll see it come into play. Uh, winning negotiations is not an accident. It's not something that just may happen. Uh, 90, uh, uh, 10% of the people will win 90% of the negotiated deals because they know how to do it, and we'll talk about some of those ways today. People don't really care about how much you know. This is an old saying that you've heard, might have heard before, but it's mighty good to put it in your playbook because some of us just get too darn big for our britches sometimes. So people don't really care about how much you know until you show them how much you care. Say that again with me. People really don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a, that's a good rule to start out with every day. Why should the employees expect their, their, why should the employer, the owner of the business, expect their employees to 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 really care about helping him reach his goal and, he, and his personal goals or her personal goals? Why should the employee really care about that if the employer doesn't care about helping the staff members see their dreams come true? The key to finding and keeping and holding and having a family spirit at your business is right here in front of you now. If you care about your employees' dreams and goals and figure out ways to help them get there, then I will assure you they will reciprocate and do the same for you and be long-term employees that are doing their best to see the, the company survive. Big, big deal. Over about three weeks from now, we'll have a special session just on this. Integrity, it can't be compromised or replaced. Uh, no matter how cool someone is, good looking, no matter what a great TV show they might have had at some time, uh, you cannot replace integrity with charisma. Charisma is very, very important, but it's not a substitute for character. And to keep yourself out of trouble, you always want to remember this when you're working with people because people will come your way with lots of charisma and zero character. There's people that will come your way trying to sell you or get you to do things, and they just got a great plan and present it so well. Lots of charisma, but lots of lies. Lie after lie after lie, and they've told them so much, they got real good at it, and there's no character there. You have to know this and search for integrity. And when you find it in people, they're good people usually to do business with and to bring into your business as, as an associate or a consultant in some way. It's often said that employees do not quit their job. They quit their boss. And I know how true that is. I've had several thousand employees through the years. And oftentimes I'd have an employee who was gone one day and I couldn't figure out why. And then I'd see him sometime later and ask him what happened. What, were they mad at me or what? And it was always they were mad at their boss, their supervisor, their manager. So you need to put into place, as you start adding employees, you've got to be really careful to make sure you're not putting a manager in place who has so few skills or such a bad attitude that he will run off your best potential employees. That's just an absolute truth. Well, that's the last of our 40 drill skills. I want to encourage you to uh, read those time and time again and kind of include them into your DNA because it is a great tool chest to help you get in the game. What can you start doing now? Get busy on Facebook. Get busy with your videos. Start getting some good testimonials. Write your uh, MVP statements. Start taking photos so you can put them online. Uh, get some photos uh, uh, or some wording on your vehicles if you can, some signage. <clears throat> get some training with your YouTube. And make sure you've got your business cards ready to hand out to everybody that might be a potential customer. And make sure you got them posted at the Chinese restaurant other places where people leave those business cards around. Get on Facebook. Let's start finding some testimonial statements. I sent you a sample of how to find testimonials, 
it's, it's an art form, but you can do it, and it goes a long, long way. Your quiz is out there. Uh, be reading your quiz, learning it, and I'll send you the one, Ashley, that you need to fill in the blanks next week. Uh, if you uh, attend, uh, five out of the seven first uh, seminars, including number six and seven, they're, 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 they are required, then you're going to uh, be eligible to, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to be eligible to receive a completion certificate from the, uh, from the uh, community college. Uh, but if you move forward and do that other homework that most of you are doing a real good job on, uh, then you're going to be eligible to win uh, the academy membership and become an associate. That may not sound like much. It's not you can take that and uh, a dollar and probably get you a cup of coffee somewhere. But you can also take that and look at it and say to yourself, I hung in there and I went the extra mile here, and I want to keep on coming back and encouraging other people to do this because our academy work, and hopefully I've tried to be exemplary of that, is that we are all about devotion to mutual helpfulness. And that's the kind of people I want to be part proud to be members of the Academy. We're going to move in now to our main topics tonight, bookkeeping, forecasting, and negotiating. So let's just talk about that. Bookkeeping, I'm not a bookkeeper, but I don't give you a lot of information. I do a lot of forecasting. I can show you a lot that makes a difference. And negotiating the same way. These are really important business skills. I'll mention again in a few weeks we're going to have a one-hour class on forecasting and negotiating to drive home even more information for you. But first of all, bookkeeping. The bookkeeping is, a, is the person that's there to help you as a business person be able to gauge what your profit and loss is month by month. That's the reason we have bookkeeping. It's also so you can pay your taxes and pay your employees and keep up with your cash flow and things like that, but primarily... We want a bookkeeping system that will help us run and operate a more profitable business. There's several people that's involved in the bookkeeping uh, family here, but let's talk about the accountant first. We're not going to spend a lot of time with the accountant. The accountant is the person that uh, looks over the bookkeeper's work. The accountant looks over the monthly totals and the annual financial statements. The accountant is most interested in federal tax returns and reports, uh, what the stockholders' issues are, are all about. That's the accountant duties. In other words, they're looking at the big picture, the long-term picture, and, and, and they're very important. But the bookkeeping is a totally different role. The bookkeeping is the process of, of looking at your daily transactions, what's going on daily, and doing it in a consistent way so you can draw conclusions. Now, I'll share with you, as some of you are just getting started now, you're doing your own books, and that's just fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. As a matter of fact, if you're just doing it on the old-fashioned ledger with one column saying what you're bringing in and the other column talking about how you're paying your bills and you're totaling up, uh, uh, keeping up with your assets, that's just fine for you to start that way. I am not advocating that you go out and hire a bookkeeper or buy expensive software until you're ready, until your business is actually up and running, or it's time for you to start keeping those records for tax purposes or to help you to be a better manager. So uh, it, pay attention. I'm not encouraging you to do that. And the good news is we've got lots and lots of people now that are, are, are offering themselves as a, as a virtual uh, bookkeeping assistants that can help you so much and at a very low and very reasonable rates. But bookkeeping, what they're doing is, is they're keeping up with financial transactions. They're posting debits and credits, uh, sometimes produce invoices for you, uh, maintain and balance general ledgers and historical accounts, and oftentimes look after payroll services. There's lots and lots of independent companies now that are offering payroll services, and lots of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs are using them. But this is all about what's happening daily, what's happening every day. The bookkeeper is watching that cash flow every day. I kind of kid bookkeepers through the years and say, well, you got the easiest job in the year in the world because all you do is you start out at zero every morning, go through the paperwork, and end up at zero at the end of the day. And and, uh, and that's what we're doing. So 
on your handout, if you've got it out or a picture in your mind, I'd like for you to go right up here, right after this S in transactions, right where my cursor is here, and put a zero there. That's your starting point, starting every day with a clean sheet of paper, a zero. And we're going to go all the way around through this process quite quickly. But at the end of the day, we're going to have another zero. And I'm going to show you the basic flow of bookkeeping, uh, how it works, first of all on this chart, and then we're going to take an invoice and kind of tear it apart and figure that out. So so, so you can see the flow. We're going to, each, each, each transaction would be a, another invoice. And we're going to tear that invoice apart and put down all the parts of it in what we call journal entries. And we're going to do some posting, which is we're going to write them down in a line in a column so that we can add them up and see if all the numbers, if all the little numbers add up to the right big numbers. And we'll do that by using a worksheet. And if they don't, then we got to fix it. We got to make sure that all the little numbers add up to, all, to, to the big numbers, and we do that with our adjustable journal entries. Uh, after we uh, take care of that piece of business, we will close out or, or we'll balance everything out, and that'll be called a financial statement for that day's work. A financial statement for that day's works, and then we'll close the books by, by showing to our our, our uh, owner, however they want it done how much money we made or how much money we spent and what did we do with the money that we made. Uh, and so if we took in $10,000, uh, the way I ran my bookkeeper's uh, 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 goals each day was whatever we took in, I wanted to see a bank deposit that day for that exact amount of money to the penny. That way I know that what came in went in the bank. Now her other list on what was going out would show that. So you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want to do it on paper or in QuickBooks. The tool that a bookkeeper needs is called the chart of accounts. Every type of account, every type of expense that you have, uh, it's got a number beside of it. So it's account number 100 or 101. Usually people first getting started will name their assets 100 series numbers, uh, like cash in the bank will be number 100. Uh, uh, other types of uh, assets that you got might be 101 or 102 or such as that. And then as far as money going out, the black ink, or excuse me, the red ink, your liability statements, then you would give them a series of numbers, and a lot of people would call them their 200 series accounts, 200 series accounts. And then in every business, it will be different. The things that come after that, you might put 300, 400, 500, depending on if you've got some other ways you want to break it down. But normally someone just getting started out would just deal with the 1 to 200 type accounts. That's called your chart of accounts. And whether you're using, writing it down, or whether you're using QuickBook or uh, Intuit or some other types of things, generally, that, you know, name your account that. So let's look at a real sample chart of accounts here that these people have got fixed up. They don't have them numbered, but they've got the different ways they're spending their money here. This kind of uh, where they've listed down their the dates, they've listed down their invoice numbers, the, uh, who the customer was, different references that they used, and they broke out of the different invoices what was going on with that particular invoice. Now an invoice is something that you will number. And uh, and you want to have you want to have them in numerical order so you can find them easily when you're going back to them, uh, and you're you're usually don't have them on paper and in your computer, so you'll have those numbers numerically because in business it seems like we always have a reason to be going back and looking at a, at an old invoice. Sometimes a customer will call you up and say, uh, Vanessa, uh, how about just duplicating that last invoice I got? and just reducing the uh, coins by one coin of each type. So that saves everybody a lot of work, so she'll just scroll back, find that invoice, make the adjustments, and move right on uh, lickety-split. That's uh, just a, a real good way to do it. Some companies name uh, number their invoices the date of the month. So uh, if you were going to name an invoice today, you might call it invoice number 2222023, and tomorrow it'd be... Uh, 223-2023, and so forth. Lots of different ways to do it. The key is I want you to know 
every time you do a transaction that you make some money, every time you bill a customer, you put on that bill an invoice number, and the next time you do a bill, make that invoice number the next one up the line, and so forth. Just don't send out invoices without any type of, of um, continuity to them or organization. They need to be organized. So let's look at an invoice here, a sample one uh, that was quite simply. This could have easily been done in pennies. Uh, now notice that the invoice, if you will, take a deep breath and look at it, kind of take it in for a moment. This is the worksheet that the bookkeeper would have used on invoice number 12, 12, 16. Well, that kind of tells me that invoice was probably written December 12, 2016. Could have been, maybe not, but if they had a numbering system that kind of looked like that. And we're talking about a box of candles here. There was a sale for a box of candles that uh, 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 Penny sold, and she sold it for $8.56. And so she's got the uh, description of the model number of that candle box. And she collected, uh, of that sale, 56 cents, 7%, was for uh, sales tax. So now we ought to keep up with the money. So if she bring that invoice down and, and enter it into the, the uh, chart of accounts, she might have a chart of account that says, okay, uh, let's determine what the cost, what the cost of that uh, invoice is. So the cost of the box of candles was $2, all right? There was $0.55 cent that went into the freight column. The cost to get it there. Penny's got a, a program in her store where the, her sales clerks earn 10% uh, commission on their sales. So she's going to take $0.80 cent out of that and put it in a, a chart of accounts for the sales commission. She also plans now to make sure she has repeat business, so she's got a customer loyalty plan going on where she is taking 5% of the sales and investing it some way to bring customers back in. Always remember with customer loyalty and, 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 and advertising, if you don't make an investment, there's no way you're going to get a return on investment, and your bookkeeping system should be telling you how much return you're getting back on that investment and this is an example of how you might set it up. So the cost of the sale here was $4.27. 427, which represented 53% of the income. At the end of the day, we're going to subtract 427 from that $8. $8 subtracting 427. And end up with what I've got written here is gross profit at 47%. That sounds like a pretty darn good number, doesn't it? Well, I've made an error here, and I'm going to tell you what it is, because I wrote down the word profit here, gross profit, and it's really not that. What this is is the margin. It's the margin on this one profit center. This is your income model that we made up for our business plan, just like Penny had made some up for us before. This is the model for it. And we know right now that when we sell a box of candles at these prices, we're going to have a margin of black ink of $3.73. So we're going to need to sell 100 boxes of candles to end up with $300 return on that investment margin. By doing this and looking at the bookkeeper's information they can provide to you, it will help you automatically determine what kind of volume you need to sell with different profit centers to bring in X amount of money, X amount of cash flow, and will really help you out by doing that. So let me ask you right now, are boxes of candles something that people want or something that people need? I bet I can get all kinds of opinions on those. If you're lighting your house with candles, you need them, right? Or if it's the Christmas season and you know that uh, candles are a major part of how people decorate their homes or celebrate the holidays during the Christmas season, I would say I would need those in inventory. Maybe some other times of year I would not need them in stock. 
So this is a way that you look at uh, after the bookkeeper tells you how many you got to sell, then you might do it. So if you say to yourself, well, I don't have any in stock now, and I want to stock candles, red and white and black maybe, other colors, but red and white primarily, and I want to sell these, and I want to make a good margin on them, early in the year I might go ahead and order 100 boxes of candles early in the year and watch that inventory as it's moving because what you will probably do is sell three or four or five times more of this, of this particular candle product in November and December so that would help you judge how much stock you needed to keep. Where do you find this good information? From your bookkeeping records. So let's go back to bookkeeping now and talk about it a little bit. I, I entered everything in. I, I listed all these things down. I got them posted, trial balance, got down to my worksheet. And uh-oh, uh-oh, I found out that when Penny charged that out, she didn't charge the right amount of tax. Just a human error. We all make mistakes or didn't give back the right amount of change, whichever it was. And I am $2 over on this transaction in my cash drawer. So the bookkeeper has got to get back to zero. A plus two up here don't count. It's got to be zero. So she would, he or she would come over here in her adjusting journal entries and make a, an adjusting journal entries and take out $2, put it over on the side, or, or add $2, whichever she decided to do. At any rate, she was going to uh, make an adjusted journal entry there that she had to make a, a change. Now, that adjustable journal entry, journal entry for a bookkeeper is a get-out-of-jail card, get-out-of-jail-card free, like you play a Monopoly. Because a number of years from now, three or four years from now, someone may be doing an audit looking for someone that was uh, stealing from the company, and everybody always looks at the bookkeeper first. So how does the bookkeeper protect themselves from being accused of things that aren't just right? Those adjusting journal entries are exactly the items that will save her because she'll be able to show on this invoice how she balanced that. Someone else might come in behind her, but if she's got a record of her adjusting journal entries, it can go a long way to proving her innocence if someone's accusing her of something. Bookkeepers that have been around a while, they save them for years. They will save those records, those adjusting journal entries, because there's no way that you could come back two or three or four years later and remember every invoice that you uh, adjusted, especially if you're in a business that's doing several hundred a day. Okay, the adjustment is made. They balance the books through a financial statement. All the, the big, all the little numbers add up to the big numbers. So we're going to close the books and say that we took in $2,100 on this particular day. I took in $2,100 and right here, I deposited $2,100 into the checking account and stapled to this piece of paper that I hand to my boss or my manager is the, is the accounting cycle for the day's work and the deposit slip where the money went. That's as transparent as you can get. Simple and easy to use, more uh, just as easy as it goes. Now, some people will use this type of system, especially when they're getting their business started, and also... Plug, plug the numbers into Facebook and make sure that, they, uh, that they're the same. Uh, my bookkeeper does that. She double checks her, her Facebook work uh, with the paper system. So that's it. That's, that's the, the main thing that your bookkeeper's work can do for you. Now's a good time for us to talk about uh, security in your business, how to protect yourself uh, from theft and fraud in a lot of situations. Just some footnotes, and this was given to me by one of our students in our last semester uh, who was sharing with us ways that you can, can protect your business from fraud and errors. Number one, it's a good idea to have the people that's preparing and writing the checks or not the same folks that are signing the check. And as your business grows, and if you need to have somebody to help you pay bills, let them write the checks, but you look at them and sign them. Sometimes it's good to have two signatures on checks, like if you're not going to be in-house and you've got two employees uh, that are uh, that need to, you need to have someone else signing the checks, you might require two signatures. Really large checks, you might say checks over $300 or $400, whatever the nature of your business is, you might say that, that uh, only 
the president or the vice president uh, can sign certain checks. Uh, when you take in a check, uh, you're, you're at your counter, you're doing business, and someone hands you a check, I want you to have a, a stamp right here beside you, just like I do right here, that stamp. And I put that check down, and I hit it, and there it says for deposit only. Deposit only. Once that check has been stamped deposit only, even if someone comes in and steals it from you, or if you lose it and someone picks it up, they can't deposit it. And, or cash it anywhere, so it's a way that you protect your business from losing that money in the future. Stamp it as soon as you can, as soon as it goes in the cash drawer. So if you've got an open drawer and a robber might come in, a thief, and, and hold you up, those checks in your cash drawer, if they've already been stamped deposit only, those people can't cash those checks or sell them to someone else. Your incoming mail is, is, is information coming into the business. And it's really good if the vice president or the president and the owner of the company opens the mail. Because when you're opening the mail, you'll see if someone's sending you past due notices or complaining letters or, or, or just weird stuff that might come in by mail. The owner of the business needs to know that because if you've got someone in your organization that's, that uh, and is used to opening the mail, they, they can get by with things because they know that you won't ever see it. So things can drag on a long time. All bank and credit card statements should be opened by the uh, president. When they come in in the mail, take the time to open it, take the time to take it out of the envelope, look back at the back page of the checks if folks are writing checks, look at the signatures, scan them. I'm not saying that you need to analyze or, or, uh, or tabulate your, uh, your bank returns, uh, settle up on them, but I am saying that whoever does that needs to know that you're looking at it before they ever get it. And that is a good way to help keep keep people honest, to let them know you're looking over their shoulders. The advantage of Facebook's Intuit and other uh, new software that's out there, the biggest advantage is they can give you all kind of charts. So when you're setting up your books, when you're setting up your accounts, you want to ask your bookkeeper to set these accounts up so that you're getting a good read back uh, on the things that are important people, uh, important to you. Uh, you can look at the percentage of wages you're paying versus how much money you're taking in or insurance. So that's really good for out, uh, uh, overall management viewpoints. But more than that, you can take individual profit centers, those individual uh, marketable profit centers that you've got, and get a system uh, feedback, a report on each one of them that shows you how much profit you're making on the individual items. Now, that is important because there it will tell you what your stocking levels might need to be or whether you're making money or not making money because it is amazing how things will change. If you see that your sales on a certain profit center are really going up high and you don't know why, you need to find out. One answer might be you're selling it so much cheaper than competition, people are coming to get it, and if you're making money, that's wonderful. But if maybe you forgot to add in a price increase that everybody else saw, then you're losing money every time you sell that. And a, a chart will show you that if, if you've got your uh, profit centers geared up to give you that information. If you see that one of your profit centers was had been selling real good, but all of a sudden it started taking a nosedive, you need to find out why. Maybe you didn't have enough stock. Maybe you got your price too high for competition. Maybe you're paying too much for it. But by seeing those charts and seeing those those, uh, those uh, trends go up or down with steep, that's a problem. You want steady, steady trends. Level is really good as long as you're in profit. But the bookkeeper, the way they've got to set up with the, uh, with the uh, software, can give you an account on every one of your profit centers if you set it up that way. All different kind of charts. It's pretty amazing what they can show. Let's talk about payroll for a minute. If you are, have someone in your organization, you're hiring someone to do the payroll, my first part, piece of encouragement is let them do the payroll. Let them do it. Give them the time and the space and the place to do it. What happens oftentimes is as your business gets to growing and you need to 
uh, uh, hire someone to help you with the books. Well, they come in, so automatically you saddle them with answering the phone. Or automatically you saddle them with answering the email. Automatically they get the ta task of going to the bank or the post office or running errands. And before you know it, they're spending 90% of their time doing something other than the bookkeeping payroll work. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Because doing bookkeeping, analyzing all these things and balancing your account is not an easy job. Yeah, it's zero to zero, but you have to focus. So my advice to you that I learned a long time is, if you don't have a bookkeeper, let them have enough private time to get their bookkeeping work done. That's going to save you money. How? Even if you have to bring in another part-time person to answer the phone during the morning or run the errands while the bookkeeper is getting that work done. Because when the bookkeeper starts making errors or has questions or trying to work too fast and things get messed up, who do you have to call? You call the accountant. Because the accountant looks over the bookkeeper's shoulder. And every minute, every tick tock on the on, on the clock that an accountant is helping your bookkeeper work something out, you're going to get a pretty significant bill for it. A bill that's so much higher than what it would have cost you to bring in a part-time person to let the bookkeeper get their work done right and, and uh, would have ever cost you. So keep that in mind. If you're spending, if your bookkeeper is spending lots and lots of time running errors and doing other jobs, you need to make some changes. With payroll, you want to make it clear with your employees that if you've got a problem with the payroll, you come to me. Or if you've got a problem with your payroll check, you go to your supervisor and talk about it with them. You don't want your bookkeeper in the middle of employee uh, uh, arguments. And they will come, I'll guarantee you. The bookkeeper can only take the information that's given to them and that comes from other people. So always protect your bookkeeper from squabbles with other employees. They need to be loyal to you, and they need to report to the accountant. The accountant needs to be loyal to you and look over the bookkeeper's shoulder. It is not a good idea for the accountant and the bookkeeper to be so tight with each other, your buddy-buddy, and may try to cover up. That gets people in trouble, too. So you got to guard against that relationship, keeping it strictly professional, have individual meetings with them, talk about, and, and have a good flow of communications with both your bookkeeper and your accountant. So how about that? A little bit of short course on bookkeeping. Let's change the subject here. We've got 20 just about on time. You know, running your small business is, uh, it, uh, we talk about getting in the game. Well, now we're going to talk about getting in the game where we it's not out front out there talking to the customer every minute. It's thinking and it's strategy. It's a lot like a chess game. You want to figure out how's the move I, t I make today going to affect me next month or next year. It's like moving chess strategies. So take it in that point. First, let's talk about forecasting. We use the word forecast so many times every day, right? I know I do usually talking about the weather. We all talk about the weather and the forecast, what's going to happen this weekend. Well, it's going to be beautiful tomorrow, and it's going to be pretty on Friday, but it's going to be really ugly on Saturday. That's our forecast. Cold and ugly. Another weekend down the drain. Everybody's talking about it. Forecasting might be, hey, man, I want to book a cruise and get on down there in the Caribbean and stretch out and uh, have me some uh, fancy high balls and enjoy the sun and the waves and uh, uh, just have some good fun, do some singing and dancing. Let's have a forecast. But, you know, even on a big cruise ship, we want some pretty weather, right? We want to go where the weather's pretty. If we're farming or, or raising uh, cattle, we need to know exactly exactly uh, when to put our, our, our boys and our girls together so that they have their babies when it's springtime. Everything's important with timing uh, when you're uh, doing almost any kind of business. It's the same way with our products and what we're doing. Timing is so very important. Forecasting when to do things. 
if you're in the uh, fish and wildlife business in the forest service, you're really interested in lightning strikes because most wildfires are caused by lightning. So people that are in that business, they have a team that gets up in the morning and goes and looks to see where there were a lot of lightning strikes across the forest uh, and what the humidity is because they know that if they had X number of lightning strikes and the humidity was at a certain point, there's probably some little forest fires out there burning right now that nobody's reporting. And they'll send an aircraft out there to find out uh, and sometimes go put the fire out before other people didn't even know it was started. Forecasting is how they do that. But let me share with you. Without forecasting or with poor forecasting, this is the sign that's going to end up in front of your business. Listen close to me. If you're not forecasting, you're not going out of business. It's that important. Being better at forecasting means you'll be better at running your business. So pay attention real closely. What are the items that we're interested in when it comes to forecasting? Stock levels are number one. Stock levels are so important because having a profitable business is all about the number of turns, T-U-R-N-S, turns total. So what, what does turns mean? Well, turns is a short term for turnovers because it makes no difference how large your inventory is. Your profitability is all about how often you turn over the stock. You make profit only when it's something is sold, and when it's sold, it's turned over. It's a different turn. And your stocking levels is going to help you balance between I've got just the right amount of stock for the business that's coming in because if I don't have the two, if I don't have enough, I'm going to miss sales. I don't lose less sales. If I have too much stock, yeah, I'm going to, I don't get some sales, but I don't have to pay inventory, taxes, insurance, and keep up with a whole lot of extra stock that is not selling. It's just sitting there getting old. That's not a good thing. So the bookkeepers don't help you do it, but you're going to need to determine how much stock that you want because you, you can't sell from an empty basket unless you've got some things going for you. So that's part of what uh, forecasting is, how much stock we want. How many people do we need on board? How many, how many people do we need for this particular uh, uh, grand opening we're having? How many times do I need to have someone come and do some training to help my staff learn things. I know a forecast that I don't open my business in six months, but I don't know how to sell. I know a forecast that I'm going to open my business in six months, but I don't know how to merchandise, but I don't know how to price my products. I don't know how to do this, and I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to open my business. Well, what needs to happen? That's the forecasting note. You need to get some training. I congratulate all of you here because it's an example of what I'm talking about. The best news is, is that about every type of training that you need before opening that store, we can offer it to you with a webinar and a seminar, or you can go to your small business center and they'll help you even find other places to do it. Really important. Be ready to do business. Cash flow. All right, I don't have a great year this year. I don't put in a lot of stock. I don't hire a lot of people. And why don't do a lot of business, but while you're getting ready to do that business or you're starting up to build it on, you need some cash flow reserves in the bank. So you're forecasting, hey, I need to go out here and get me a credit line because I may need as much as ten or twelve or twenty five thousand dollars before my cash flow starts bringing it back in. Cash flow predictions is forecasting is absolutely critical. Forecasting your risk with risk management forecasting. And an insurance company is all about risk management forecasting. Your company needs to be all about it because insurance isn't going to answer all your questions. Every We got risk, so have you given some thought to what are the risks in your business? What do you need to do to, to avoid risk? Well, step one is to start listing them down, what you think your risks are, 
And then beside that, let's risk down what you can do about it as a risk management tool. Now, I've got some good news for you. Once you determine the type of your business and how you're going to run it, you can go to an independent insurance agency. Uh, they, that's, they, that's usually what they call themselves, independent insurance agency, uh, that specialize in serving small business, and they will be able to type into their computer the type of business that you're running, and their insurance company will already have a list of probable risks related to your business. I mean, that's what they've been doing, so they know. And the rest of the story is, if you do business with this agent and that company, they'll give uh, you can see what your risks are, and they'll have you check them off. If you're doing good risk management work after six months, you might get a little reduction in, in your premium. But if you're ignoring a lot of the risks that y'all had both had talked about and not doing anything to protect you or them, then you're going to get an increase in your insurance policy. Just know that's coming. Sometimes the insurance company will give you a low a, a low discounted rate, uh, and, but there'll be fine print there that after six months it may be adjusted. Well, that adjustment is all about your risk management rules, what you're doing there. So keep that in mind. What kind of advice can I give you about this? Risk management? Go out and find someone with this old gray hair, someone that's been there and done that, there's no reason that you have to worry and pull your hair out about getting good advice about the particular business you're in. There are folks out here that will be glad to talk to you. All you have to do is ask, and they'll probably tell you more than you want to hear. Or if you go to your small business center director, tell him what you're thinking about doing, he will probably know someone in the, in the area that uh, he can talk to on your behalf or maybe set up an appointment for you. Um, I don't know what type of business that you're thinking about doing, but I probably know someone that's been there and done that, and I could make a recommendation to you to talk to them. That is good time spent. Please get past the point that I don't want anyone to give me advice. Now, I know us guys like reading maps. We're, we're not going to pull in and ask somebody uh, how to correct the wrong term we made. We're just awful about uh, going somewhere and asking someone for directions. But when it comes to running a business and taking a chance on losing a lot of money or not making a lot of money where we could, if we knew the right way to go about it, it's a good thing to get the advice. And it's the right place for me to say again, your small business center is here for you. Recognizing the demands in the market will have everything to do with the strategy that you're using. So maybe uh, some of you have just said, uh, like Dave says, uh, Steve, I'm just kind of taking it in now, just kind of getting a, a feel for what it's going to take, and that's just fine. One of the things it's going to take, Dave, when you get serious about spending your money and time, is you want to have a strategy in place as to how you're going to have customers help find you, how you're going to help those customers come to you. Because without the customers, we're not going to be in business. Someone once said, like in the Field of Dreams movie, if you build it, they will come. Bull. We need a marketing strategy plan that's going to bring them to us. And that golden goose plan we talked about will do it for you. So know that. So our goals in forecasting. Our goals in forecasting. Why are we talking about this? Because we want to have the right product, the right quality and quantity of them in stock. We want to have it at a time, make sure we've got it at a time when the market is ready, when people are spending money on it, hopefully on things they need. And we want to have bought it at the lowest price point possible. As a matter of fact, we want to be able to have bought it so that we already know that if we have some surplus, that we'll be able to liquidate it and still make money on it when we liquidate it. Now just let's take this little ride on the magic carpet with me. Let's let's get on that magic carpet and go up to Lowe's stores, or go up to to uh, Walmart stores or Target stores, and we're going to arrive there sometime maybe late September uh, or just after Halloween even, and it's going to be full of Christmas products, right? 
I mean, the stores will be jammed up to the ceiling. The warehouses are full of Christmas lights and decorations and such as that because they have said this is something people are going to need at a certain time, and we're going to have a lot of it in stock when they're buying it. But I want to tell you, they when, when you go in there on December 27th, and they've got a 75% sale sticker on those same items, on items they didn't sell, do you think they're losing money when they give that large percentage off? No. Nah. Because they had taken the, 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 uh, the forecasting and determined how much they need to sell. They need to determine how they don't want to take a chance on running out. So they're going to buy it at a price that they can put those uh, stickers on them and sell them for a good low price. But if it doesn't sell, they're going to sell them at a price that they can liquidate and still make money. Now, when we were doing our, our, our price tag sales in week three, and we talked about uh, pricing uh, in week three and week four, that was all about planning ahead and forecasting how you need to price your product. So even if you have a surplus, you can sell it at a low price and get your money back. That's what forecasting is going to do for you. That's, that's the plan. And let me tell you, the first year, you might not be so hot at it may miss the mark, but you don't have your records. After you have that, that sale year, you don't go back and see how many you bought, how many you sold, what the pricing was, and next year you don't make some adjustments that's going to help you be more profitable. Uh, probably you're not going to spend too much or way too much on your first year because you don't want to take that risk. That's smart, but from then on, you're going to use those records to help you do your forecasting. If you have any questions about something related to forecasting related to your business that you want me to talk about in another session or just to send you an email on it, then you just drop me an email. Let's talk about negotiating now and closing deals. Negotiating and closing deals. You know, that someone says, you know, at, at a retail store, nothing really happens to the bell rings, till that bell on the cash register rings or, or the ticket is written and that ding, 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 okay, money's, money has, has changed hands. Well, deals are being closed all the time, sometimes just the point of sale right there at the cash register. But oftentimes your bigger ticket deals where you're buying or selling products to sell for the future or you're negotiating uh, deals with your customers uh, take place in, 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 a, in a private room, and that's kind of important that way. So I'm going to tell you that, we talked about forecasting, and we'll talk about negotiations. I don't put the two words together and tell you that you can forecast a successful negotiation. You can forecast a successful negotiation if you do your preparation. It's all about doing the homework. By setting your target goals of, of, of what, what, how much money you want to make, what the prices are, what the terms are, what the different concessions will be. Thinking about it ahead, putting brain power to work, goes a long way telling you in advance whether or not you're going to have a chance to get in the deal. Part of your presentation is learning how to introduce yourself. Learning how to introduce yourself is so important. Your <clears throat> mindset. A lot of us might think, well, if I'm going into a negotiation with someone or they're coming up wanting to buy one of my products, it's me versus them. They want to buy it for the least amount of money. I want to sell it for the most amount of money. Therefore, we're enemies with each other because we're going to be battling for our position. Wrong. Big time wrong. So let's set that record straight right now. Your customers that are coming to you talking about buying, when you're saying, it's, it's, it's take it or leave it. You're not going to say to you, you're going to say, let's talk about it. And when you say, let's talk about it, what I want you to understand, they're not your enemy. They're your negotiating partner. Negotiating partners are people that have come to the table to find a win-win situation for both sides. And if you have that mindset going into the deal, everybody's more friendly and you're off to a better start. When you're negotiating, where you sit in the room is really important. When you have a chance to, to sit down beside a customer or to stand beside a customer uh, and you're into a give and take, negotiating, let me tell you that if you're face-to-face, -face, 
looking at each other, one's on one side and one's on the other. It's always better for you to turn to the side and stand to the side of someone and, 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 and see, see across the front so that you can say to them these words. Now look here, I'm here for a win-win situation, and I'm on your side now. I'm on your side. We're not against each other. And if you're actually standing there and you physically show that, that is pretty remarkable to a lot of people. They'll say, all right, I get it. That's a good thing. If you're sitting at a table and you're on opposite sides of the table, just the, the position puts you at odds. So when you have a chance to sit down at a table and negotiate with someone, sit beside of them. Or one on person sit at the end and one right beside that. Do not be in face-to-face -face uh, confrontation if you can help it. It goes a long way. The documents that you're bringing to the negotiating table need to be works of art again. Need to be works of art. You have taken the time to answer the questions. You got the frequently asked questions already written down, so you have uh, forecast what people are going to ask you, and you're ready to give a good, solid answer. And every time you are able to, to ring the bell with the right answer that shows how smart you are and how much prep you've done, you go up and in, 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 uh, you are improving your relationship with your negotiating partner. Because they're saying to themselves, well, hey, this person's a professional. They know what they're doing. They came prepared. <clears throat> if you don't have negotiations like uh, real estate, cars, expensive items, tractors, uh, other type of items, you want to have your bargaining range set before you ever get to the room. In other words, you want to have a road map of you're going to price, uh, you're going to start your pricing at this level. And then because of the, the type of option it is, these type of negotiations usually have three or four counter offers. You're going to go ahead and plan what your first offer and your counter offers and such as that will be to help you end up at the right place, to help you end up at that goal that you set to begin with. So as we get into it and it moves and the, and, and the offers start going back and forth, the very second, that, that uh, your negotiating partner makes you an offer, you know in your mind how much you need to add or subtract to your counter offer to end up with the goals that you want to make. It is fun. It is amazing. And, and uh, again, in a few weeks we'll get in on this, and I'll show you how to do, do the numbers in that. So you can bring some secret weapons. Did you know that you already had a secret weapon in a negotiation? So that when you're going before you get to that meeting to close that deal, before you go to work in the morning to talk about your jewelry or whatever else that you're selling that day, you already have in your mind that as a customer asks me a question and I need to come back, what are my secret weapons? Well, all of us' secret weapons are the value-added features that we bring to the table. Value-added. What is value-added? That is the little things that you do or say or that you put into your product or your marketing, that you're doing something that's not costing the customer hardly any more money but is giving them a benefit. Let's say that you're a, you're a stylist and you own your own salon and your customer comes in and you make it a practice. You make it a practice that when you're buying a, a chair for, the, for your customers to sit in, you always buy a little bit extra, a whole lot nicer to make that chair more comfortable. You've got a button they can push that'll give them a massage or that'll warm things up, maybe roll a little bit, some toning. You spend a little bit extra money to make sure that you bring a lot of value added to the game because when the customer sits in it and says, hey, I'm paying you the same amount of money I pay other people, but I sure do feel better when I get up from here. Or maybe you make it a practice to give that neck massage or scalp massage as you're giving a shampoo. You go that extra few seconds to make it feel good, and you actually say, now listen, do you, you kind of like this scalp massage? Uh, you want me to keep doing it? Well, give them a few more seconds and say what they want. What you're doing there is creating hospitality because customers feel better when they're doing business with you. They are more apt to come back to see you when times are tight because they're getting value-added items. Maybe when someone comes into your store, you, you offer them free coffee and chocolate chip cookies. 
don't cost hardly anything, but it is there. Maybe in your store, you've got better lighting. You do a better job. Maybe at your website, you've got more frequently asked questions, better pictures, and lots more videos. Those are the secret weapons that help you close deals. Those are the type of items that will keep you in business 60 years when your competitor went out of business after six months. That's just straight talk, my friends. There's no reason for me to cover it up and try to make it pretty or ugly. The secret weapon is absolutely important. The most important secret weapon now, or listen closely, no extra charge for this. It may make you millions of dollars through the years, but it's in the plan. You don't have to pay a penny more for this little tip. The secret weapon when you're closing deals and closing negotiations is your ability to capture the moment. Your ability to capture the moment. That is to say that you can be a little bit of drama, that you can bring in a, 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 a little bit of stagecraft, uh, that you can enjoy a little bit of suspense, and you know how to steal a few seconds. Because the dramatics in your presentation when we're negotiating can set you apart to the point that you, you indeed get the customer's attention, and when you do that, they're able to let go of the anxieties. And sometimes that magic moment when you capture the taking a moment of silence, because when you do start talking again, they are listening. Or number two, some type of gesture and a pause. Capturing the moment is something that will be unique for each and every one of us, different, but you can do it really well. Penny did her, her, her extra really nice uh, presentation on her latest video. She did everything really good on that and talking about it and such as that, but there was, there was no drama there, and drama is what brings it up. That pause of that. We needed more volume on the video, too. You have to think about uh, what's coming out on other ways. And sometimes we'll make a video 10 or 15 times to get the right mark in it. And sometimes we just need to, need to get in a great big smile, uh, say something, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that, that will capture that particular customer's attention to the point that says, hey, that caught me by surprise. What this is is gorilla negotiating. Learning how important that secret weapon is to capture the moment. Now, <clears throat> President uh, Biden was in Europe yesterday. Uh, maybe one of the most important speeches from an American president since Ron Reagan's days. There's a lot on the line over there. And whether you are right with his politics or not, I want to tell you he is a master. He is a master at public speaking. Because that old fellow who's older than I am was able to get up there and capture the moment with his phrases, with his pauses, with the drama he brought into that situation. That was a great speech. And you can do that, and I can do that. We just have to remember to prepare for it and be thinking about it as we're doing it. Next week we'll talk about this uh, pretty much in detail, and you'll really have fun with it, okay? Eye movement, pauses, a little bit of long silence, turn your volume down, get people to listen to you closer if you're face-to-face. -face. Eye contact, very, very important. You have to practice it to get good at it. When you're negotiating, you always want a best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which I like to say is a plan B. Now, let's say that I'm going to go out and buy a lot of raw materials for the jewelry that I make, or I'm going to, I need to buy a lot of, of uh, challenge coins to sell to a certain outfit, and so I'm going to do some shopping because they want to buy a thousand of them. So I don't have a, I don't find out where I can buy a thousand and what price they're going to cost me. And then I'm going to start shopping somewhere else to see indeed how much I can improve that. Your plan B is where your shopping starts, especially buying below fair market value. Always have a second alternative. 
if you don't buy a, a, a used pickup truck, go find a pickup truck you like and, and, and negotiate to a fair price, write it down, write the details down, and then start shopping using that alternative plan B as the basis that you're shopping at other places. Because when you go to the next place and you find that basically same pickup truck, you're going to negotiate lower at a lower price than what plan B is. Now, let me tell you, been in business a long time, and everyone will negotiate if they're serious in business. Don't let people say it's take it or leave it. If it is, you leave it. Because there are other people out there who have bought too much or paid too much or need to sell it. There's lots of reasons for people to give you a great discount. Everything. I want your business so bad I'll give you a better deal. So don't be ashamed or say I'm not uh, I'm not sophisticated enough or I'm too sophisticated to ask for a better deal. You have to do it. That's a part of being a, an entrepreneur. Be ready to negotiate and do it. I wrote a book called Yes, If, No, But Negotiating. Uh, it's available to you at Amazon at a very low, like $1 or $2 price. Uh, you're able to do it. Uh, lots of good information in there, but I'll cover most of this information uh, tonight and next week. The first four rules in negotiating. Ready? The first four rules in negotiating. Don't give up anything unless you get something in return. It's all about give and take. That's part of what you're going to be thinking about. Don't give anything unless you get something in return. Make sure your ticket price is up there high enough that they can make the first offer, and you know they're going to make a, an offer lower than that first ticket price, so you'll have room to come back with your first counter offer. Uh, generally, you'll be able to forecast how much that first offer will be. For example, if you're offering an item at $27,000, and fair market value on that particular item is $24,000, I can pretty much tell you that an experienced negotiator is going to make you an offer less than $24,000, way below what your asking price was. But you're going to know that, and then you're going to be able to counter it until you end up making the money that you need. Number three, your first question always when you're buying something, when you're negotiating, and you need the best price you can get, is to say, now, is that your best price? Come on now, can't you give me a better price than that? Nag them, yeah, nag them. You're not degrading yourself. You're absolutely asking for, is this your best price? And let me tell you, a large percentage of the time, they will come right back and take some uh, negotiate, uh, uh, take some money off the price tag. Simply because you said those, is this your best price? Because you said those five words, you get a, a, a concession. So just make it a habit. There's nothing wrong with what we call in Sampson County poor mouthing when you're out here negotiating. That's what I call it, poor mouthing. I have customers from all over the country. Some do it different ways, but it all adds up to when I get, now Steve, I see you got that price at the website at so-and-so. Can't you do a little better than that? And then I'm right ready to move right into it and start negotiating with them. Do not stop the process. Do not close the deal uh, when you when you think there's any chance that, that you can make it do. So if you're saying, no, I can't do it, take it or leave it, then you have basically invited them to take their money somewhere else. What I do want you to do is to master yes, if, or no, but negotiating to keep them talking, to keep hope, and to close the deals. Because, my friend, it's not always about the cheapest price. And you have to keep talking to find out about this feature and that feature. Negotiate here and there. Maybe the terms or the deposit or the tax or the delivery or the assembly. There's all types of things you can take about, talk about. So here's what yes, if, and no, but, how it works. You make me an offer, maybe $5,000 for this item. And I say, yes, I can take that $5,000 if... You don't make me put those set of new tires on there. Yes, if. I didn't tell my customer uh, we can't do the deal or take it or leave it. I said, let's talk about this. Or I might have said, uh, you offered me $5,000. No, that won't quite work. I appreciate the offer, but 
no but. No, that won't quite work. But if I don't have to put those new tires on it, we might be able to swing this deal. What do you think about that? You don't want to be the one that's saying, no, forget it, take it or leave it. You want to be the one that is looking for a way to find common ground with that customer. And you can do that with Internet customers, with people on the phone, uh, uh, Facebook and otherwise. Every type of shopper, you can figure out a way to use yes, if, no, but if you plan to do it. And planning to do it means that customer is going to do business with you, be happy because they'll feel like they got a good deal, a negotiating partner, and then what do they become? A raving fan customer that will go out and tell people, good gracious, I enjoy doing business with Valicia. She is such a good negotiator. And Danielle just made me feel good about doing the business. And I know Sarita gave me a great deal, and I'd recommend that you go see her. And I've been looking all over the place to find a place I could afford to rent for my special occasion. But Amy figured out a way to help us get in the deal. Uh, uh, we kept talking about it and came up with the options, and it, it works. People love to tell other folks about what a great negotiator they are so that they will send customers to you. It is so important. Now, in negotiating, we call them tactics and ploys. And there's actually 21 different ones, and I sent you a handout that lists them all out. If you were at, uh, at Duke University getting a master's course in doing business, talking about negotiation tactics and ploys, they would talk about those 21. Uh, they're used all over the world. It's the same thing. But we don't have time tonight to talk about 21, so I don't talk about the nine most important ones that are used. This is a t uh, different ploys and tactics that people will use when they're negotiating with you. Let's call the first one to burst the bubble. Burst the bubble just started being used recently, and that example of that is someone's interested in buying some real estate that you've got listed. So they call their agent, have a chat, and the agent calls you and says, Steve, I've got someone that's kind of interested in your property, but they want to know that if you would accept an offer that's quite a bit lower than what you've got it listed at. Hmm. The purpose for that them doing that is to try to lower your expectation, burst your bubble on thinking you're going to get an asking price. And that doesn't mean you don't think there's other people that will pay you more than asking price, but they're setting you up for a low ball offer. And, uh, they don't want to waste their time with a low ball offer if they don't think you'll consider it. So what should your answer be? What would yes, if, no, but tell you? Yes, please tell them to send that offer on in. I need to hear it. Because if you're in the marketplace, you want to know what the offers are. And they have no idea about what kind of range you have. Maybe you've marked it up really high, and their offer may be above uh, your uh low dollar uh, price on it. So always consider the offer. Always. It doesn't cost you anything. Flinching. Uh, remember uh, 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 Sanford and Sons? Remember Sanford and Sons? Someone would make, 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 a, make him an offer and he said, oh my God, I'm having a big one. Oh my God. It makes a, a physical sound like it's hurting him. That movie is called Flinching. And you can do it like old Fred Sanford did or maybe you ladies can just Oh, put your hands up here like it's giving you a headache. Some type of motion, physical uh, action that says, man, that didn't feel good. And you don't say anything after doing it, usually. You just make that motion. Now, sometimes when, when, when I'm using this ploy, I'll, I'll listen to what they say, and I'll, I'll just look them right in the eye, and then I'll turn around like it gave me a crank in my neck, and it hurt, and I have a bad look on my face. And, you know, I'll keep doing that until they say something because sometimes what they say is, well, I can do a little better. I can do a little better than that. I mean, it works. Don't cost you a penny. The next most effective thing you can do that doesn't cost you any money is just be silent. Someone makes you that offer. Someone makes you that offer, and you just basically, wow. You look at them. Maybe take your glasses down and look at them real hard. Like, are you crazy as H? What are you What are you thinking of making that offer? But I'm not saying that. I'm saying it with my nonverbal communications. Frown on my face. And I don't say a word until they talk. Because sometimes what, when they talk, 
what they come back with is, well, maybe I can do a little better. What do you think about this, this offer? Silence is very important. What folks are using today, especially during in inflation, inflationary times, is you need to go ahead and buy this because prices are going up every week. And if you get it now, uh, you'll be able to beat those price increases that are coming. That's a very effective negotiating tool. Now, you got to remember, there's two sides to each, each thing. So I'm, I'm giving you the standpoint of people that are, are, are trying to get you to come down on your price. Uh, when we do our in-depth study in a few weeks, I'll give you both sides of it. The red herring is really important because that's a strategy you use to get people to take the, their eye off the ball. In other words, you've got something you want them to see, but you've got some things you don't want them to pay attention on. So the used truck salesman would lean up against a pickup truck and point out those great new tires and point out that new upholstery and tell you all about the new engine that's in this truck while all the time he's leaning up against a dent that's in the fender so that you don't see it. That's, that's what you call the red herring approach. And it can be used a lot of different ways. A lot of lessons are learned from that. Retreating to higher authority is when two people are sitting at the table on one side of the negotiation and the other person is there. And that person says to you after you've made them your best offer, you know, I appreciate that, but I need to go talk to my wife about this. I've got to retreat to a higher authority and talk to my wife about this. That's a real important negotiating tool. It's used all the time, and there's good uh, comebacks that you can use to keep it from working. Splitting the difference is when the two parties are basically, uh, I'm at, five, I'm at uh, uh, $100 and you are at uh, $300. We need to split the difference and find common ground at $200. Well, that's just simply said, but there's a whole process to go through here to where the where that you would use words and terms to get people to make you that offer to split the difference. And then you will take that and split the difference again uh, without coming off your price. In other words, you can split the difference two or three times as a professional and end up improving your position each time that y'all split. Once a customer says, hey, why don't we split the difference? I'll tell you that you've got the deal. They've made up their mind that they're going to do whatever it takes to make this deal. So once they get in that frame of mind, it's a game, and, and you want to use your tools to make sure that you don't give away all your profit. Having cash in your, pro, in your pocket or having a checkbook ready to write the check out and show them is a real effective way to get someone to take your offer by saying, hey, here's the cash money. Uh, there's X amount of money here. I've got $4,000 here in my hand. You wanted five. But if you want $4,000, it's right here for you. Otherwise, I don't go down the street and offer it to someone else. That's powerful. And it works whether it works best if it's cash money, but it works also if you've got a check already written out for $4,000. You had to forecast and plan uh, this, this uh, uh, tactic if you plan to use it. Nibbling is what all of us do and all of us can guard against. Nibbling is when after you make a deal, that the buyer keeps saying, well, how about this and how about that? Like uh, I'll use a car, for example. We just closed a deal on a car, and uh, I'm going to get the paperwork fixed up. I sent it to the office to do the finance work. And that customer says, now, this does include those free floor mats, right? And this does include that free uh, 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 gas every, every so often. And you are going to throw in – you are going to throw in uh, – that spare tire that don't come with new tire, new cars anymore, just like you had mentioned. And they go on and on and on getting all the freebies that they can get added into the deal that they don't pay any more money for. So this is where yes, if, and no but comes in because the way you battle this is when you close your deal in that deal closing I mentioned earlier, you write down the figure that that, that y'all traded at draw a circle around it, and you put your initials there and hand them the pencil and say, let's, let's make sure we got this number down pat before I send it back to have the, the uh, finance work done. Then when they say, I want this and I want that, you're able to say, now, look, our deal was for this amount of money. And, yes, I can do that for you, but I'm going to need to add a certain amount of money. Or, no, I'm sorry, I can't throw that in. That wasn't a part of our deal. But... I can do it if you want to add a certain amount of money. Yes, if, no, but help gets you out of the nibbling game. Really important. 
Now, in your handouts, you've got 12 more uh, uh, ploys and tactics to look at. In selling, you want to look for the the uh, buying signals from a customer. Customers are going to send to you nonverbal communications that they are, uh, and sometimes what they say, that they are, are assuming ownership about the things they say, like, hey, I'm looking forward to having that and putting it in my garage. Or Now, when you bring this, you need to bring it here and then put it there. Uh, concentrate on different attentions about the delivery. Or show a disappointment if they can't get it faster than they wanted it. What that's saying to you is they've already in their mindset determined they're going to buy this product. And when people give you buying signals, you need to hush, close your mouth, and quit selling and start closing. Move from a, a selling mindset to a closing mindset. A, B, C, always be closing. So we would wrap it up quickly. We would get all of our paperwork done, get our witness signatures in place, get our check deposits, get our down payment, and uh, gr congr always congratulate them on what a great bargainer they are, what a great negotiator they were, and how much you enjoyed working with them, and wow, how they beat you down. It is a must that that customer walks away thinking they got the best end of the deal, that they took advantage of you even, and, and but you're man enough to smile about it. You want them to walk away saying, hey, I can do business with them because they're fun to do business with and I don't get a good deal. No other message needs to be in their mind, so you have to plant those seeds for them. You have to plant those seeds. And then when they walk out the door or see somebody else tomorrow or the next day, they will be saying to them, what a great place you have to do business. That's where your raving fan customer works. All of that happens by planting seeds like we're talking about right now. But after you do that, shut up and get out of there because buyer's remorse is a real thing. People will think about it or somebody will try to talk them out of the deal. The sooner you get your paperwork done and your signatures and deposits in place, you move on out and don't move out celebrating and, and, and yawking it up like you're the best negotiator there's ever been. Now, you do that in private. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, negotiating stories that I can tell you, and I always, I'm going to go just a minute or two over here if you don't mind, to share with you that when you're dealing with farmers, you, you deal with a lot of uh, great characters. And one of the greatest characters in our region is Mr. Honeycutt, who's been a real good friend uh, of my dad's and such as that. And for you, uh, back in the 50s, early 50s, when you saw him coming to town, he was driving a truck that looks just like this. And... Uh, at what we call him Mr. Ball. Mr. Ball bought Alice Chalmers tractors. That was his brand. That was his brand. And he was a person that had a tractor for every job. He had 12 or 15 uh, Alice Chalmers tractors, had a barn for each one of them. He was unique. Every one of them uh, had to be delivered at night and cash for them. And people, when, and he'd trade them every now and then. And when someone heard we were getting in one of Mr. Uh, Ball's tractors, they would wait in line and pay a premium price because they knew it had been well taken care of. But what made him a great negotiator inspired me to be a, try to be a very good negotiator, and I'll share this with you to help you. He did a certain number of things every time, but he bought important ingredients to the negotiating table. He was serious. He didn't go just beating around the bush, wasting people's time, getting prices on this and that if he wasn't really interested in buying. So the people that worked with him knew he was serious. He bought the money with him. He had the cash resources to buy whatever y'all negotiated on, so you didn't have to worry about him going back for a, a higher authority. He had proven 100% trustworthiness. And when he spoke, you need to listen carefully. He would almost whisper sometimes. That was his way of getting your attention. He would talk so low that you'd have to get down and repeat everything so there was no doubt about any misunderstandings. He had a historical pattern of being a great negotiating partner and would come at the right times and he understood the prices so you could talk to him honestly without wasting a lot of time and he knew the right questions to ask and you never wanted to take advantage of him because he trusted you. So what what does that do for you? What does customers like that do for you? When you have the common ground 
and the ingredients of being a great negotiator, you're going to get the best deals every time. When you establish a relationship with people that you're buying from, buying your materials that you need to buy right to sell, and you have a good relationship with them, and you pay the bill like you're supposed to, and you have learned their names personally, no matter how big the organization is, you've developed a one-on-one -on -one relationship with people you're buying from, you're going to get the best deals every time. Folks will call you up and let you know about best deals that they don't know let your competitors know about. And the same thing's true on the other side when you're, with, uh, with your, when you're uh, selling to other people. So let me tell you, negotiating is really important. So take the time to think about this and read these and kind of practice in your mind about how we're going to do this. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about how to close the deals and negotiating is going to come into play. And then uh, in a few more weeks down the road, we're going to get into this uh, uh, really heavy on how to uh, uh, forecast how the negotiations goes. This will give you so much self-confidence and take away that scary stuff about, I'm kind of afraid to get in business because I don't be buying stuff I ain't ever bought before and just don't know how to do it. But if you feel good about your negotiating ability and how to do your research, that's the part of being uh, forecasting and uh, different areas where you might feel que queasy about. Uh, write me an email and talk about it. Talk to someone that's been there. Don't go into a negotiation feeling like you're disadvantaged. Never go into a negotiation feeling like you're disadvantaged. There is very seldom a deal that you have got to do. And if it's not a win-win situation, then probably you just need to pass on and look for another alternative. That's, that's where we're at. So I've enjoyed uh, sharing this with you tonight because you're getting right into the nitty-gritty of, of how to buy and sell and keep your business going. And I indeed hope that uh, you all have enjoyed it as well. So let me uh, turn the mics back on. We'll say good night and ask any, answer any questions that you might have, and we'll go. All right, Julia. Anything you'd like to share? We'd like to hear it. Any questions or comments? Um, I'm good. Thank you for the presentation. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Good to hear from you again. I do have a question. All right, go ahead. Google Business. For my Google Business page, I think what the um, holdup may be is because I have an iPostal address, like a post off box, post PO box. Should uh -huh. I use my home address to get it? Let me tell you, to get started, I would, un unless you just do okay. not want to give your home address out. Uh, that's the decision okay. you have to make. But uh, I, the address I use is the address where I ship my products from or maybe a retail operation, but uh, the post office is good, but, but uh, I I can't see in your business with the type of business a big uh, risk that you're taking by giving your home address out. Okay. But that's your decision to make. Okay, so I'll change it. Yeah, you have to okay. prove to them that you, that you are thank you. address. Yeah, thank you, to make it. Good mm -hmm. question. Have a good night. Mm-hmm. Annie, did you get something out of tonight's uh, program? Hello, Annie. Just wanted to touch base with you. Hi, Sarita. I see you're close to your mic. How are you doing? All right. How are you doing? Good. Good. I hope you learned a little something tonight. Yeah, I did. I did. Good. Great class tonight. Thank you so much. Hey, Renee, it's good to see you back with us. Are things well up in the Henderson area? I see you got your mic on, Renee. Can you hear me? Renee's a real hustler, a great entrepreneur, and we've been working on some QuickBooks issues. All right, any other questions, folks? So here's the plan. Uh, if you want to do this again, you can join us tomorrow night. Same same plan. Uh, we'll be doing the same presentation. And then next week we're going to be talking about taxes, record keeping, 
depreciation, deductibles, and how to close sales. It will be a jam-packed meeting uh, next week, and so I look forward to seeing you for that too. Uh, tonight's presentation and next week's are required uh, to get your uh, uh, academy uh, membership to become an associate. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Hey, Steve, I have a question. And who am I talking to? Amy. Okay, Amy. What you got? So if you do, if you don't want to have a leave it or take it mentality and you're negotiating with a customer, you're selling a tractor for, you're selling it for $8,000, but, you know, you negotiate this price and you're going to sell it to this customer for $7,000 because it just works out for that deal. How do you keep them from being a raising fan customer that then goes and raves about how they got it at $7,000 and then everybody wants it at $7,000, although that's not what you want to sell it for? You remember when I was talking about with Mr. Ball that you could all you you had a trust relationship with them. So when you're going, when you're giving someone a price that you can't give to other people, you need to let them know in in, in unset terms. Now, if anyone asked you about this, we certainly want you to send them to us. But you need to tell them that you got the last one at a certain price. Uh, that's that's a good thing to do. And and the next one will be a little more. But do it in such a way. That, that people will keep sending the customer to you, and it's perfectly okay because everybody runs out of uh, machines or out of deals uh, sometimes that, that different things uh, do that. So don't worry about that. You go ahead and get your deal because that customer is going to go out there and can simply say, I got the best price I could find anywhere, uh, and it's so low I can't share it. Uh, so you just become a salesman and, and, and uh, put, put the talking on it. I hope that helps you. Yes, it does. All right. Okay, I'm going to uh, mute the microphones to you all. Good night. I really appreciate you being with us. And look forward to getting any information or questions that you have. Keep keep the uh, keep the videos and the MVPs coming in. You're doing a great job with them. Uh, thank you so much for participating and. I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.